This is the 2016 God's Quality Control Easter Special. In this video, some thoughts on why anti-Semitism is even more bogus than you think. I'll open with a passion narrative based on historical probability rather than theological bullshit. I'll close with some comments on the rise of anti-Semitism. For Christmas, I received a subscription to a large collection of university lectures by Mr. Bart Ehrman, historian of Christianity and professor of religious studies at U North Carolina, Chapel Hill. His lectures have given me the historical foundation for this video. I begin the Passion story with some context. Jesus spent the final week of his life in Jerusalem during the Passover celebration. The Passover commemorates Moses delivering the Jews from their slavery in Egypt. In Jesus' day, the festivities stirred the hopes of many Jews that a new Moses, a Messiah, would rise from their ranks and lead them in revolt against Rome, a foreign occupier in the land God had given to the Jewish nation. There were sometimes riots. The historian Josephus tells of one riot in which thousands of Jews were butchered by Roman soldiers. Into this flammable situation comes Jesus the loudmouth, stirring people up with his proclamation that the kingdom of God is at hand, that is, soon to arrive, necessarily overthrowing the Roman oppressors. Although Jesus doesn't mention this last part, not publicly, he knows that's how his audience will take it. The city authorities in Jerusalem, let's call them the Sanhedrin for short, recognize a catastrophe in the making. Being obedient Jews, they follow the commandment to love thy neighbor, trying to prevent the slaughter of countless of their neighbors. They attempt to stop Jesus, but he persists. They don't dare arrest him with the agitated crowd looking on for fear of provoking the riot they hope to prevent, so they arrest him at night. If the gospel accounts of Jesus' final week weren't already fishy, they begin to smell pretty bad in their description of his arrest. It's unlikely the Sanhedrin would have paid one of his disciples to learn of Jesus' whereabouts. It would be much cheaper simply to have him followed by one of their own staff. Professor Ehrman allows himself a bit of speculation about this part of the story. Rather than giving away Jesus' location, what Judas reports to the Sanhedrin is that Jesus has been claiming to be the expected Messiah. Again, something he has not claimed publicly, but has discussed only with his inner circle. The Sanhedrin don't need this information to justify the arrest. Preventing a riot is more than enough reason. I'll allow myself a bit of speculation. Believing Jesus to be simply a troublemaking bumpkin, they probably intend to jail him only until the end of the celebrations, letting those myriad Jews from all over the world go home alive. Then they'd send him back to Dustville. But his belief that he is the Messiah requires that he be moved to a different judicial venue, Pilate's court. That's my speculation. As for the alleged trial before the Sanhedrin, it makes no sense they would try Jesus for blasphemy. Other than some almost certainly fabricated comments in John, nothing Jesus says in any of the Gospels is blasphemous. It also makes no sense they would trump up blasphemy charges to justify turning him over to Pilate. Pilate is a pagan. He couldn't care less about the Jewish God or his self-esteem problem or the sensibilities of the Jews. The Sanhedrin know this. They aren't stupid. They would not even bother to mention blasphemy to Pilate, so it's doubtful they would charge Jesus with it. More likely, some junior Sanhedrin employee simply asks Jesus, through the bars of his cell, whether he thinks he is the Messiah. Jesus either remains silent or answers in the affirmative. So he is delivered to Pilate with the report that he is inciting a riot, claiming to be a usurping king. Pilate probably asks Jesus one question only, the one he was already asked, but from the standpoint of a Roman official. Do you think you are the king of the Jews? Jesus gives him the same answer he gave the Sanhedrin. Pilate doesn't hesitate to condemn another revolutionary, neither the first nor the last. Jesus is convicted and crucified by the Romans, not the Jews, for sedition, not blasphemy. Within two decades of Jesus' death, Christians were already implicating the Jewish people in the crucifixion. Arranging early Christian writings in chronological order reveals the progressive nurturing of anti-Semitism into grotesque maturity. Anti-Jewish sentiment is already evident in Mark, the earliest gospel, which reports the Jewish mob calling for Jesus' death. This is invention. There was no Jewish mob. Pilate wasn't in the habit of requesting permission. And if there had been an insurrectionist named Barabbas, Mr. Barabbas would have been hanging on a cross, not waiting around to be pardoned by a clamoring Jewish throng. 
But Mark excuses this fictitious lot somewhat, blaming the Sanhedrin for stirring them up. Matthew, written later, has Pilate defending Jesus and Pilate's wife warning him that Jesus is innocent. Luke, written around the same time as Matthew, has the Jewish mob condemning Jesus without the prompting of the Sanhedrin. John, the last canonical gospel to be written, goes on and on about the Jews opposing Jesus, even having Jesus say they're trying to kill him. John has Pilate vigorously resisting the Sanhedrin, but finally, overwhelmed by their determination, he hands Jesus over to them. Not many years later, someone writes a gospel under the name of the Apostle Peter, claiming the Jewish client king Herod is the one who orders the crucifixion. At about the same time, one Melito, the bishop of Sardis, delivers an inflammatory sermon on Easter Sunday, condemning the Jews for killing God. Anti-Semitism is the monstrous offspring of Christianity. If anything I've said here is erroneous, it's my fault, not Ehrman's, and I hope you'll let me know. As it turns out, I didn't need the subscription. Ehrman discusses all of this and much more in great detail on his website, ehrmanblog.org. I encourage you to subscribe. He charges a fee and sends all the money to hunger and homelessness charities. That's the 2016 God's Quality Control Easter Special. Thanks for watching.